Hi, my name is Boris Havel, and I teach political science at the Faculty of Political Science, University of Zagreb, Croatia. And mainly I teach courses on contemporary issues in the Middle East. In today's lecture, we will speak about early Muslim attitude to the Jews. Now, the most important question when we start to discuss early Islamic attitude to Jews are the sources. What are the sources to understand Muhammad's and early Muslim understanding of the Jewish community? And those are canonical Islamic texts. Those are the Quran, the holy text of Islam, Hadith, the short teachings and sayings of Muslim prophet Muhammad, and Muhammad's biographies called Sira in Arabic or Sirat Rasul Allah, the most important of which is the one written by Ibn Ishaq, which is also the oldest one, but also I should mention at Tabari's History of Prophets and Kings, which has been translated into English if you want to study it. Now, these texts provide us with an understanding which is quite coherent and uh, uh, not, not so difficult to grasp and understand. Now, let me just for a second compare early Islamic sources with Christian sources. If you are a scholar and you want to know what was early Christian position on anything, there are a variety of sources that you will have to consult. Of course, primarily Christian canonical texts, Old Testament, New Testament, early church fathers, and the like. But then there are also apocryphal books, of the Old and the New Testament, there are heretical books, there are anti-Christian texts, there are um, independent sources uh, which give you a context in which Christianity appeared, uh, such as Josephus, Josephus Flavius uh, writings, or Philo of Alexandria. And these sources will give you all kinds of aspects and thinking and interpretation and understanding. And it's quite easy, you know, you can get easily confused uh, on, on uh, precise issues. Uh, when it comes to Islam, early Islamic sources do not have any alternative texts from which you could get another perspective or, let's say, second opinion. There are no apocryphal texts of Islam. There are no heretical texts, and there, are no, there is no Josephus. All that we have in studying early Islam are official Islamic texts. All that we have is what is officially approved by the Muslim community. And again, Again, those texts are the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sira. Except for those texts, what is uh, relevant for understanding development of Islamic thought is early history. Early history is uh, normative in Islam. And when we say, say uh, early and normative history, it is, it is history of uh, Muslim prophet Muhammad, his life, uh, his life in, in Mecca and later in Medina and then again in, in Mecca, uh, and also of the first caliphate, the Ar-Rashidun Caliphate, uh, when Muhammad's first four successors ruled and expanded Islamic empire. And those four are Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman and Ali. When Ali died in 661, the community, the Ummah, the Muslim community, uh, split into two, into Sunni and Shia. And this lecture is primarily about the Sunni community. Now, during the second caliph, Omar, 
Islamic Empire spread enormously from the east to the west, as you can see from this map, and it expanded so much that later history, Islamic history, invented a name for Omar, which is Al Farouk. And if you research the etymology of the word uh, Farouk, you will find that it means savior or redeemer. It's a messianic title to a caliph, the second caliph, given to him only because he achieved great military and political victories. Now, now um, uh, uh, these victories were so important that uh, a famous Orientalist wrote in his uh, also very famous article, The Quest for Historic, Historical Muhammad, that in, in Islamic understanding, in Islamic perception of themselves, this conquest is viewed as proof that Muslim community in the eye, eyes of God is the correct, the, the, the theologically correct community so much that uh, uh, F. E. Peters compared it with Christian understanding of uh, uh, Easter or, or the resurrection of Jesus. From Christian position, Christ's resurrection from the dead is proof that Christianity is the right faith. From Muslim perspective, uh, perspective early Islamic victories are proof that it is Islam that is the right religion. So the role of military victory and uh, great political rule has been understood in theological terms throughout the Muslim history. And basically that is why uh, we can uh, claim uh, that uh, religion and politics are one and the same in Islam. In Islam, there is no separation between church and state. Religion and politics go hand in hand. It's one and the same. Now, when we uh, focus more on the, uh, on the Jews, we will see that Muhammad took very distinct, clear position to Judaism and the community of Jews, just like uh, with, with any other issue that he was dealing with. He was a very pragmatic uh, politician and leader of the community. Now, in the beginning, he uh, believed that um, Jews will accept what he understood as a new revelation and that they will join the Muslim community. So his attitude to Jews and Judaism was positive. But then very soon it proved to, you know, uh, be wrong. And so he took another attitude to Jews. And now there is a problem. Which attitude should we understand as normative? Now, of course, there are other issues in Islam in which we can find conflicting messages. And uh, Muslim scholars and theologians understood it too, and so they provided us with a method of interpretation which is of great help of our understanding of Islam's position on uh, any issue, including the understanding of the Jews. And that method is chronology. If one revelation replaced another revelation, then what is normative and should be followed is the new revelation. The old one is abrogated, not valid anymore. And uh, uh, from that perspective, if we uh, think uh, about uh, Muslim political dealing with uh, uh, Jews or Christians or, uh, um, again, any other legal issue or theological issue, 
it is the new understanding and the new revelation that is normative and the old one is to be uh, forgotten now when muhammad came to medina when he fled from mecca to medina in the year 622 he encountered three jewish communities as i said earlier his uh, initial attitude was positive to Jews because he believed that the Jews will join uh, him and accept him as a prophet but the Jews did not they made fun of him they rejected his prophethood and they even opposed his community according to early Islamic texts and very soon Muhammad entered into military fight with those Jewish communities and he succeeded in defeating all of them one by one after Muhammad defeated the three Jewish communities of Medina he turned to Jewish community in Hyber which is just north of Medina a stronghold of Jews who are great warriors again the Islamic texts tell us about this primarily Sira and uh, Muhammad and his army besieged the Khyber and defeated the Jews some of them they killed and some of them they turned into first Dhimmis the Dhimmi people who is uh, translated by some scholars as protected minorities uh, I would uh, prefer term rocketeered minority that is a minority that lives under Islamic State but has to submit to Islamic laws and has to pay special tax to remain alive and in their faith so basically Jews were defeated and they posed no danger to Muslim community when Muhammad died in the year 632. Now these texts which speak about the conflicts between Muslim, early Muslim community and the Jews are referred to in Arabic as Yahud and when the word Yahud is used in early Islamic texts it is usually with negative connotation. But there is another word used in early Islamic texts for the Jews which has actually quite positive connotation and it's Banu Israel. For example, in the Quran there are verses in which it is said that Allah, God of the Muslims, gave the Holy Land, Ard al-Muqaddas, he gave it to Banu Israel, the Israelites or the Jews. And based on these verses, some modern Muslim scholars believe that the legitimacy of the Jewish state can be accepted by wider Muslim community. And there is also a very important and um, significant, I would say, hadith. Hadithu uh, Bani Israela Walla Haraja, which means ask children of Israel there is no shame in it what is it all about when well, namely Muslims did not know much about their faith as it was developing uh, Muhammad's position was not so much into deep teaching on, on, on context of the rise of Islam but on, on dealing with arranging the, the community life of community political social and military issues so Muslims would ask him who was that Yusuf and the Musa and Harun that, and Suleiman that you, you, you talk about and then Muhammad says to his followers ask the Jews so it is a very unexpected perhaps attitude that he shows and positive one that if Muslims wanted to know more about their own faith they can ask the Jews there is a great article written by uh, professor Kister 
on that issue and uh, you can find it if you google it uh, on um, internet but now let's go back to uh, muslims as yahud now these muslims are described as uh, 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 mean as uh, wicked but they were always defeated by islamic community they tried to kill uh, muhammad but they failed in it they tried to uh, defeat the muslim community but again they failed uh, according to um, uh, muslim teaching jews uh, also failed to kill Jesus. Of course, we as Christians, we know that it was not Jews who killed Jesus. Uh, Jesus gave his life and it was uh, our sins that killed Jesus, according to, to, to Christian understanding. But in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Christian folklore, I should say, Jews were accused of killing Jesus. According to Islam, however, Jesus never even died on the cross. So basically, according to Islamic understanding, whatever Jews tried to do, which is wrong, they failed in it. They did not uh, did not succeed. So uh, Quran uh, describes the Jews on one uh, place as humiliated and miserable uh, and uh, a great jewish scholar on early islam yehoshaphat harkabi uh, he basically says that uh, uh, in classical islamic uh, texts and in, in the world uh, the main feature of jews was that they were not important again if we compare this understanding uh, in the muslim world with the christian understanding uh, of um, even Christianity, uh, uh, early Christianity, but then uh, also medieval uh, Christianity, is that um, in the Christian understanding, Jews were very mean and very powerful. Jews killed Jesus, according to already first authors of Christianity, uh, Melito of Sardis, uh, for example. Jews were accused of deicide. And the logic of early Christian thinking was if Jews could kill God, then they could do any major harm to society. That is why Jews were accused of bringing misery to societies. Um, and uh, during Middle Ages, Jews were accused for, um, uh, of spreading disease or causing crops to fail, which is a, 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 a amazing level of power. In Muslim world, Jews were never accused of these mighty mischievous deeds, let's put it this way, because Jews were understand, again, theologically as mean, but weak. Allah made them weak. Allah made them defeated. And the, the, the Muslim community always prevails over the Jews. That is how Muslim community proves that they are correct and the Jews are wrong. So based on Muslim theology, the Jews are not understood as wicked um, uh, uh, in a way that would endanger Muslim community. And they were never persecuted as people who brought misery to Muslim community. Great scholar Bernard Lewis, he basically said that uh, the situation of Jews was in Muslim world never as bad as it was in the Christian world. And indeed, he also said it was never as good in the Muslim world as it was in the Christian world. Now, when we conclude this overview of um, Muslim understanding of the Jews, what we can uh, say is that there is definitely an anti-Jewish attitude. The Jews are viewed as somebody who is 
unfaithful to God's messages, a community that corrupted their holy texts and took away prophecies of Muhammad that allegedly existed in, in, in the Bible. Uh, and uh, they did everything in their power to oppose the Muslims and their prophet. However, they were not, and they were defeated militarily during Muhammad's life and that's it that settled the issue forever in the time of the rashidun the jews already did not pose any military or political threat quite on the contrary some jews understood even uh, uh, um, some of the caliphs as messiahs and uh, joined um, the muslim community uh, but the Jews who remained Jewish, who did not convert to Islam, were viewed as a community that serves as an example how Allah approves Islam through powerful military victories and political strength, and as an example of a community that was like obsolete, he allowed the Jews to exist and to live. And this is the attitude of both early Islam but also classical Islam all the way until 20th century. And it is the 20th century and the appearance of modern Israel that presented Islamic world not only with a political and military challenge after Israel successfully defended its people and borders in the War of Independence in 1948 and 49, but because the Jews, Israelis, defeated Muslim armies, it started to pose theological dilemma for the Muslim community. And that theological dilemma, that political entity Israel poses for the Muslim world is a topic which is of great importance and is of of enormous relevance for understanding modern Middle East, but it can be addressed in some other lecture. Thank you for watching this video.